You see, slavery wasn't just a chapter in one culture's history. It was a global phenomenon, and the North American Indians were right there in the mix, practicing it, and also falling victim to it. We're talking about various tribes, folks. They'd capture people from rival tribes through raids and battles, not sparing men, women, or even the little ones. But that's not all. Native Americans also had whites and black slaves during the colonial period all the way through the Civil War. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. How common was Native American enslavement? Were there any major differences between Indian slave owners and other ethnic slave owners? And who were the most notorious tribes when it came to enslaving others? Buckle up, because we're about to spill the beans on this forgotten chapter of history, but it's important to note that their main reasons for it weren't about race. Instead, it often stemmed from differences in tribal customs and conflicts over territory and resources. Slaves were frequently taken to fill the roles of those who had been lost, particularly as laborers. Orphan children were usually raised within the tribe as if they were part of the family, without any distinctions. This inclusiveness extended even to white captives, as seen in the well-known story of Comanche chief Quanah Parker's mother. Cynthia Ann Parker, the mother of Quanah Parker, found herself in a unique situation when she was captured by a Comanche band during the Fort Parker Massacre in 1836, along with her younger brother John Richard Parker and cousin James Pratt Plummer. Over time, Parker became a part of the tribe and even had three children with one of its chiefs. However, at the age of 33, she was forcibly taken back by the Texas Rangers during the Battle of Pease River, which is also known as the Pease River Massacre. This event marked the end of her life with the Comanche, and she was returned to her biological family against her wishes. For the remaining 10 years of her life, she deeply mourned the loss of her Comanche family and refused to fully adapt to white society. Now, different tribe cultures had varying attitudes towards runaway black slaves, but it's crucial to remember that not all tribes treated them the same way. Take the Iroquois Nation, for example. They were located in places like New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and made up of tribes like the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca. Now, when it comes to the Iroquois, historical accounts tell us they didn't hold back when it came to pursuing slaves, regardless of their ethnicity. The French documented instances where Iroquois tribes went on brutal raids to capture both black and white slaves. These captives went through incredibly tough and painful times, enduring humiliating torture, all in an attempt to break their spirits. This dark side of Iroquois history reminds us that the treatment of slaves among indigenous groups wasn't consistent and could range from acceptance to downright brutality. It's a stark reminder of how complex human interactions and power dynamics have been throughout history. In the mid-1760s, there's this really interesting part of American history that not many people talk about. It's all about the Native American tribes and their relationship with slavery. So in New York, they had these treaties with the Huron and Delaware tribes saying that runaway slaves should be sent back to their owners. But know this, there's no record of them actually doing that, which leaves us wondering what really happened. Now there's another cool part to this story involving the five civilized tribes in the southeastern U.S. They got that name not because of where they came from, but because they did a lot of stuff that looked like European culture. They had their own government systems converted to Christianity, pushed for education, even married white settlers, and owned black slaves. Why did they do all this? Well, they thought that by acting more like Europeans, they could avoid being kicked off their land and persecuted. These five tribes were the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole. The interesting thing is that only the Chickasaw and Choctaw kept their enslaved population until 1866, after the Civil War when the government stepped in. It's a real head-scratcher of a story. This bit of history reminds us how America's early days were shaped by complex interactions and compromises. It shows how culture, Politics and survival played a big role in the relationships between Native American tribes, European settlers, and enslaved people, shedding light on a less talked about part of American history. In the 18th century, something not widely known is that some Native American tribes, like the Catawba and Cherokee, had black slaves. Unlike some tribes who integrated slaves into their communities, 
These tribes often made their slaves work hard without blending in. The Cherokee tribe, especially, had a lot of black slaves, and they bought many from white slave traders during colonial times. In 1809, records say they had almost 600 black slaves, which was a big number back then. Surprisingly, the Cherokee Constitution didn't consider children born to black women as part of the Cherokee Nation. They didn't officially recognize marriages between Cherokee people and black slaves until they changed the rules in 1839 and 1855. At the same time, when racial tensions were high in America, black Americans were facing violence and lynching while fighting for equal rights. Shockingly, the Cherokee tribe believed that black people shouldn't have the right to vote, making the racial tensions even worse. After the Civil War, when some former slaves went back to their communities, they got a pretty unfair deal from the Cherokees. Cherokee Chief Lewis Downing tried to fix things through the legal route, but the bigwigs at the National Council and the Cherokee National Legislature shut him down. They basically asked the federal government to kick out what they saw as intruders. This whole situation just shows how messed up the relationship between Native American tribes and enslaved people was during that crazy time. But in the middle of all this mess, there's a cool exception in the Cherokee Nation, the Kituwa Society. These guys were like a secret club fighting against slavery. They had their own underground railroad going on and offered a safe haven for runaway slaves. Their roots were in Christianity and they were kind of connected to the Masonic order, but they were all about bringing back old time religious and moral values. They stood for things like harmony, inclusion, teamwork, and coming together, which was a hint of hope in a time filled with racial tension. On the flip side, the Chickasaw Nation was all about farming, growing cotton, corn, tobacco, raising livestock, and keeping chickens for themselves and to sell to white folks. They relied heavily on black slaves to get all this work done. Interestingly, they kind of liked mixed-race Chickasaws who had some white blood more than the ones with black ancestry. They even gave the white mixed people more power. This messed up hierarchy meant that if any Chickasaw got involved with a black person, they'd get publicly punished with fines, whippings, and getting kicked out of the nation. The Chickasaw Nation was really against mixing races, and it shows how complicated things were back then. Now, the Creek Nation had a lot of interactions with black people. Some Creek people helped runaway slaves even though they still believed black people were inferior, mainly because they did a lot of plantation work. Sometimes black people ended up becoming Creek slaves, and shockingly, the Creeks even sold some runaway slaves back to their white owners. In the 18th century after the American Revolution, white authorities put bounties on runaway slaves and wanted them back. But the Creeks often said no, standing up to the pressure from white people. As we rolled into the 1850s, things changed in the Creek Nation. They started owning more and more black slaves, especially with the big move out west. It's estimated that around 10% of the Creek Nation's population were black slaves during that time. These shifts in how Native American tribes interacted with black people during this period show that it was a pretty complicated mix of cooperation and conflict. Back in the day, the Choctaw people in Georgia had some pretty strict rules in their 1840 constitution when it came to freed black folks and runaways hanging around their territory. They basically said no to them owning land in Choctaw land, so these guys couldn't own any property. On the flip side, white dudes often got special permission from tribal chiefs or U.S. agents to live in Choctaw territory, and this made it pretty clear that there was a big racial gap when it came to land ownership, but it doesn't stop there. The Choctaw Nation's constitution made it crystal clear that black people and their descendants couldn't become citizens or hold any official positions. It was a whole different story for white guys married to Choctaw women, though. Their kids could become members and even citizens. This just showed how they had this pecking order based on race and who you married. Things got even more complicated when Christian missionaries showed up. At first, they were cool, building churches and schools. But when they started preaching that slavery didn't jive with Christian values, the Choctaw leaders were like, thanks, but no thanks and asked them to hit the road. It was a sign that they were dead set on keeping their slaveholding ways. Just like a lot of white slave owners back then, the Choctaw leaders 
wanted to make sure their enslaved folks couldn't read or write. This was a common strategy in slaveholding communities because they were afraid that literacy might spark slave revolts or resistance. So, the Choctaw Nation's history during this time is a real mixed bag of race, power, and slavery in the U.S. It shows how different views on race and culture played a big role in how policies were made and relationships worked within Native American tribes. Slavery in Native American tribes back then was pretty complicated stuff. A lot of the Indians who owned slaves or were tribal leaders had mixed backgrounds, mixing it up between Native American and white worlds. And guess what? Sometimes even the big chiefs and slave owners had a bit of Indian and black blood in them. Take Pompey Factor's dad, for instance. He was a Medal of Honor winner from the Black Seminole crew. Now, when it comes to tribes, the Seminoles were kind of the cool kids on the block. They were more chill with their black slaves, often bringing them into the tribe. The mixed race kids from these unions got treated just like everyone else, like Pompey Factor's family. His dad, with his black Seminole roots, hung out in the community and helped raise his kids. But here's the deal. Not all Native American tribes were as easygoing as the Seminoles. Even though the Seminoles were generally welcoming, they still went on plantation raids, snatching up black and white slaves. A bunch of black slaves thought the Seminoles were their ticket out of slavery, so they took off and joined the Seminole gang, hoping for a better life than the one they had as slaves. Things were going kind of okay until the first Seminole War ended. After that, helping black runaways became way too risky. They started sending them back to avoid getting in trouble with their white owners. General Thomas Jessup had this wild idea that if there was a second Seminole War, the whole South could go up in flames with black slaves rebelling against their owners and joining forces with the Seminoles and maybe other tribes. When the Second Seminole War wrapped up, these tribes packed up their black slaves and headed to Indian Territory, which is present-day Oklahoma. Thanks to the U.S. government's relocation plan, Pompey Factor's family was part of this move, and they ended up in Arkansas. Some folks even made their way to Texas. It's kind of wild to think that while they were getting pushed onto reservations, some of these Native American tribes were still holding on to their own slaves. The Seminoles got stuck on Creek lands, and since the Creeks were into Chattel slavery, some Seminoles thought, hey, that's not a bad idea, while most of them didn't really dig it. But the Creek and other tribes started raiding Seminole properties to steal their slaves. Pompey Factor's family and a bunch of others decided to make a break for it and headed to Mexico, where slavery was a no-go. This whole westward journey was all about chasing freedom and getting away from the awful institution of slavery. It had a huge impact on history, not just for those who found freedom, but also for the crazy political conflicts that went down and shook up American history, especially as we got closer to the Civil War. When enslaved folks and their families started heading out west, they brought slavery with them to places that weren't used to it. They went to places where slavery wasn't allowed by law, and that messed with how things were done there. It was like a clash of ideas, with these freedom seekers bumping into settlers who had all sorts of opinions about slavery. You can imagine, that stirred up a whole lot of tension and trouble. In the end, this whole westward movement and the different attitudes towards slavery in these new areas added fuel to the fire between states that allowed slavery and those that didn't. It was a big reason why the Civil War went down. The fight over whether slavery could spread into these new places became a major deal, leading to the split of the nation and a huge, devastating war that changed the course of American history. Pompey Factor's family and their escape to Mexico were just one piece of the bigger story that shows how deep and tangled the issues around slavery were in the U.S. during this crazy time. The way Native American tribes treated black folks they had as slaves back in the colonial days and beyond 
is a pretty complex piece of history. It's worth mentioning that in a bunch of cases we've got on record, black people in Slavidby, Native American tribes had it somewhat better, and their quality of life was often better compared to those under most white masters. But here's the twist. There were tribes that didn't do slavery at all, whether it was black people or anyone else. Instead, they took in runaway slaves and made them part of their communities. These tribes showed real kindness to those on the run, which didn't sit well with some white people who didn't like the easygoing treatment these runaways got from their Native American friends and owners. Back in 1850, the famous black speaker Frederick Douglass dropped a real brain bender. He said something like, you know what's crazy? Slaves sometimes get treated better by those Native Americans than by their Christian masters. And here's another interesting twist. Some government guys, like this white Indian agent named Douglas Cooper, got all worried about how Native American tribes were treating their black slaves so nicely. Cooper thought they should bring in some white dudes to show them the right way to handle black folks. Oh, and check this out. Back in the 18th century, some Native American women actually bought male slaves, set them free, married them, and had kids. Those kids were considered free under the laws of the time. Talk about rewriting the rule book. You know, back in the day, this whole thing wasn't really looked at too kindly in the states where they had slaves. But if we take a closer look, the way Native Americans handled slavery was all over the place. It was like a big mix. Some tribes had their own rules and councils to figure out what to do with black slaves and even white ones too. Now, when it comes to how these slaves were treated, it really depended on which tribe you're talking about. But one thing's for sure, Native Americans, while not everyone was doing it, were definitely involved in the whole black slave trade thing, to different extents, of course. And that wraps up our video on the forgotten truth about the Native American slave owners. Remember, history is full of surprises. Thank you for joining us on this amazing journey into the Native American history. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.